So welcome back to the next VNOC after a long pause. Pim volunteered to talk about shoving a lot of packets and a lot of traffic through regular off-the-shelf hardware boxes using Linux and VPP. Um, and Pim is doing magical network stuff at IPNG in Switzerland. And the stage is yours. All right, rock on. Thanks a lot for having me, uh, Max, uh, and also André Donk, uh, someone who I know from way back then, uh, had a presentation about VPP at VNOG last year. Um, that's how I actually uh, came back to maybe uh, giving an update on, on how far we are in the community there. So my name is uh, Pim van Pelt. I am a uh, Dutch uh, member of the RIPE community since about 1999. The uh, first RIPE meeting that I joined was RIPE 34. I've been using PIM at IPNG.nl for uh, about 23 years. I moved to Switzerland uh, in 2006, about 16 years ago. Got the obligatory vanity domain there. Uh, got bored in the pandemic and decided to incorporate IPNG into a limited liability company to play around a little bit. So IPNG Networks uh, GmbH is a developer of software router suites, uh, VPP and DPDK, two things that I'll talk about in this, uh, uh, in this presentation. We're an absolutely tiny operator from an absolutely tiny town in Switzerland called Brutbizellen. It's not known uh, by anyone except for maybe the traffic jams at Brutbizellen routes every day. Uh, it's in Switzerland though. It's next to uh, Zurich City. Uh, we also operate a somewhat larger ring uh, around uh, Europe, from uh, Zurich to Frankfurt, uh, up to uh, Amsterdam, uh, to the north of France in uh, Lille, and then Paris uh, to Geneva, and then back to uh, Zurich again. And uh, on this ring, we operate 12 uh, completely open source routers running uh, vector packet processing and BIRD as a uh, routing suite. And this talk talks a little bit about how I managed to do that. Uh, we're peering fiends. Uh, we do like uh, peering on the flap, except for us, uh, it is uh, Frankfurt, Lille, Amsterdam et Paris, not London per se. Although maybe in the future, I might hop over to uh, London as well. Uh, we did acquire AS8298, a four digit AS number, uh, purely vanity. It was gathering dust in the corner and I asked the previous owner if I could please use it. Previous owner was my own uh, project six axis and we, we got the thing. Uh, sort of in my hands, and uh, we operate that now uh, in uh, in that ring. So first, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, DPDK. It stands for the Data Plane Development uh, Kit. It's originally a library written by Intel. Um, ironically, this runs in user space. People always think like the kernel is faster, but that's not necessarily always true. Um, in this case, the kernel is super slow because it gets an interrupt for each packet that you uh, receive, and then it has to make like all of these decisions on what to, what to do with the with the packet. Um, whereas DPDK uh, takes a slightly different approach. Um, it runs in uh, user space and asks the kernel to give it the entire uh, network car and then uh, does a, a kernel bypass with SRIOV or user space IO uh, virtual functions uh, to access this device and then just starts pulling it really quickly as fast as it can. Uh, so every thread here will run 100% CPU uh, in a pull mode driver, um, but it's very fast. Uh, so as soon as there's work to be done, uh, we read one or more packets from the NIC uh, and uh, run them to completion uh, in a model that essentially, uh, you know, is constantly receiving, processing the packets, uh, routing them to the next uh, hop, or perhaps firewalling them, natting them, tunneling them, like all sorts of stuff that you might normally do in, in a router. Uh, scales linearly, though. Uh, DPDK uses threads, uh, one per CPU core. Uh, and you can subscribe to the queues of network cards, like typical modern network cards will have 192 or 256 queues, which means you can take one 192nd of the traffic and send it to one CPU thread for further processing. Uh, on the outbound path, uh, every NIC can write uh, on multiple TX queues as well, and so your CPU threads running DPDK will subscribe one each to the outbound uh, network cards. And this kind of means linear scaling. If you have one CPU that does maybe a million packets per second and you had 10 CPUs instead, you would do 10 million packets per second because these threads are completely uh, independent from one another. So VPP uh, expedites packet processing because it no longer uses a linear flow for each individual packet, but it reads a vector of packets, a list of them, up to say 256 packets from DPDK or, or other sources really. And uh, these packets are often prefetched and directly written into the CPU because the CPU will have the PCI controller 
uh, and instead of asking the network card to pass it through the CPU into memory, you may just leave it in the CPU uh, and it never exits the CPU again. Um, the first packet in such a list will maybe have a uh, lack of instruction cache hit, uh, but then the small routine in one of these bubbles to the left is loaded into the CPU instruction cache in the second through nth packet go blazingly fast because we don't have to do anything outside of the CPU at this point. And further, VPP uses all sorts of smart optimization techniques for you know, modern CPUs that do a single instruction, multiple data like SSE or AVX. Um, doesn't do context switches, uses huge pages in the kernel uh, so that your, your mallocs are at the granularity of uh, say uh, a gigabyte. Uh, and, uh, and therefore has much, much higher uh, throughput in general. And as I said before, uh, VPP and DPDK are entirely lockless, which means they, they just scale uh, linearly with the uh, amount of CPUs you're willing to give them. Oftentimes, uh, drivers for DPDK are aware of the silicon offloading in the network cards. And so you may imagine uh, perhaps uh, TCP IP offloading, VLAN offloading, uh, VXLAN offloading uh, is all available and will be directly used by the silicon instead of uh, the, the user space process, which further increases the throughput a little bit. So this graph is a directed graph and all the packets will go uh, through it eventually. You can imagine here, DPDK input goes through ethernet input. It's an IPv4 packet, IP4 input needs to be routed. So we do a lookup, we rewrite the header and transit it out on an, on an Ethernet output node and eventually into the physical NIC to be marshaled on the wire. Uh, but you can add plugins uh, as well, and that's exactly uh, uh, what I did. If you um, look at VPP, uh, it takes away your network card, so you no longer have an ETH0 or a, an ENPS0, right? They, these things are gone, and they're bound uh, into a VPP process that is just running in user space. And there's a way to control it via an API. Um, there's a CLI interface for it called VPP control. And here in this slide, you'll see me just set up 10 gigabit ethernet 300, give it an MTU and an IPv4 and IPv6 address and set a default or at least 2000 slash three for V6. And you know, I'll set a default uh, for IPv4 as well. And then the thing just starts forwarding. So you can show interfaces like uh, a total amount of bytes and total amount of packets and maybe drops and, and other things. It's a very large, uh, API control surface, and, and it's all available as an RPC endpoint in uh, VPP, uh, but it kind of keeps it at that. My machine that I develop on is called Hippo uh, because it's always hungry for packets. Now, it's great that you can control the control plane or data plane rather and configure it with uh, API calls, but that's not very useful because it means if you want to do anything more complex, for example, BGP or OSPF, you may need to implement that as a, a VPP nodes as well. And there's already really good software out there. And so instead, uh, a bunch of us in the community decided to take a different route. Um, I originally wrote a VPP plugin. It's there on GitHub if you want to check it out that creates a TunTap interface in Linux. Uh, from uh, the VPP process. And if you're taking a packet from VPP and it is destined to an IP address on the router itself, uh, we'll copy it into the tap so the Linux uh, kernel will see it. We call this punting. And on the way back, any packet that gets stuffed into the tap uh, device gets picked up as an Ethernet frame in VPP and handled by the data plane natively. Um, then we have a second uh, plugin that will synchronize the state of VPP into Linux, like let's say you created uh, a sub interface or you added an IP address, uh, we would like to copy that as well so that the Linux side sees it. And the other way around, if uh, you change anything on the Linux side, perhaps create a sub interface there or set a route over the interface. Uh, we'll listen to Netlink messages in uh, the VPP plugin and then program the, the data plane with what we learned you know, via the Netlink uh, messages. And so this allows operators to use VPP almost exactly like it was Linux. You can put back an ETH zero if you'd like, configure interfaces, addresses, routes, you know, do that with IF config or IP, uh, or use common tools like FRR, maybe BIRD. Uh, and it turns VPP kind of as an equivalent of a, a software ASIC. Um, and I say this uh, in jest, but the ASICs of the good old days are actually significantly slower than CPUs of today. Uh, I, I remember the trio from uh, from Juniper. It's a fantastic chip when it came out, but it's kind of sort of slow right now. 
and CPUs have marched on, you know, the ASIC is 15 years old, maybe, and the, the modern CPUs that you'll buy, like a, an AMD a Milan a Epic or, or, or an i9 or a Xeon are significantly faster than that old silicon. So for the curious, uh, later on when the slides are, are uh, released, there's a bunch of code uh, that I wrote for this. I wasn't alone. Uh, NetGate helped out a lot. Cisco helped out a lot. Uh, so thanks to Neil and, and Matt and John for the collaboration on this plugin. Uh, a bunch of parts here to create sub interfaces and, and sync the state uh, from VPP to Linux. Um, create sub interfaces in Linux automatically and the other way around with the Netlink listener, as I described. Um, ultimately, um, there's a how to at part seven that's, I think, most practical if you wanted to give it a go. It shows how I would compile, build, deploy based on Debian or Ubuntu um, these things in production. So the state now changed with this plugin. The only thing we have to do is ask VPP control to create what we call a Linux control pair, an LCP, uh, based off of this 10 gig 300 and call it XE0 in, in the Linux kernel. So this thing pops back up and you can manipulate it. You can set it up with an MTU and you can give it an IP address, but now we're no longer using VPP control, but just IP. Uh, and these Netlink messages go from um, the kernel into VPP to be able to program its side of that pair. You can do some more stuff like create a VLAN, call it servers, give it tag 101, an MTU 1500 maybe, and some addresses and some default routes, and we're off to the races pinging quad eight. So in production then, um, I deployed 12 of these smaller super micro machines with a Xeon D, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a little bit. And they have six 10 gig cards, Intel X10, that's a four card, and then the X552, which is on the motherboard directly. And they have six one gig Intels as well, and a dedicated IPMI. Uh, these machines cost maybe 1300 francs or also euros these days, uh, and they do about 38 million packs per second. Uh, I interconnect all of them via 10 gig backhaul links over a uh, transit provider, in this case, IPMAX, uh, and then I connect to any IXP that will have me. I'll monitor these things with SNMP so I can put them in LibreNMS or Observium. And then I also have to do something smart with data, place, uh, data plane configuration management and control plane configuration management. So for these, I wrote two tools as well. And if you look to the left here, the top guy, that's not my router. Uh, this is a backbone router from IPMAX, uh, Cisco ASR 9010 a beast of a machine, a packet warehouse, really. Uh, but my guy's down here at below. So you'll see the one U server there uh, takes a little bit less power than the, uh, than the ASR 9K, you know, roughly 45 watts or so instead of three and a half kilowatts. Uh, and uh, ironically is a little bit faster than its uh, upstairs neighbor. So first I have to add uh, a trick for SNMP because the only traffic Linux will see is the stuff that is destined to the IP addresses on the router. So if anything goes through the data plane, it's all handled in user space by DPDK and VPP and I won't see it. And so what I need to do is pull the VPP state of packets in and out through the data plane and expose that in SNMP. So I wrote an SNMP agent for that, it's, uh, it's on GitHub. I added a logo and some distro changes to Libra NMS, the NMS of choice here at IPMG. And so you can see this stuff then live on a router in Frankfurt. Um, things casually doing 18 uh, gigabits of traffic. It's uh, pretty fast. The CPU is not even hot at this point. It can probably go five or six times more than that. But if uh, I wanna configure the data plane, there's a problem because uh, there is no config persistence in VPP and that's by design. Uh, VPP is an API control surface. And if you wanna configure it, you need to write an external utility. There's a couple of them out there. Some are larger, some are smaller. Uh, I took the approach of uh, VPP config, uh, a thing that is on GitHub, reads a YAML configuration file with a bunch of uh, uh, syntax in a user guide there. And make sure that the YAML config file is uh, structurally sound, like no, no typos and weird fields. Using Yamala, it's uh, the 23ME guys that wrote a uh, uh, syntax checker in Python. And it also checks it for semantics, uh, using a constraints language that kind of makes sure you're not trying to compile something into the data plane that will not uh, be logical. And as an example to this, if you wanted to have an L2 um, interface that is doing bridging, 
uh, you can't give the L2 interface an IP address because it makes an L3 interface. And so we may be able to catch all these types of weird configuration errors uh, by means of semantic validation. And then it has three main functions. The first one is to dump the running state of a VPP into the YAML file. That's to create the initial config after you've tinkled with it a little bit. And then the second one is to plan a path from that current configuration that is running in the data plane to any required desired state. Um, pretty smart with this. It uses a declarative engine that does a, a sequencing using a directed uh, acyclic graph that you see here on the left-hand side, at least a small part of it. And it tries to plan a path from where you are in the data plane to where you want it to be based on your configuration pump. And then it can either show you which commands you would want to type uh, on the router, or it will apply it directly using the API. Um, I'm going to target inclusion of this upstream in the upcoming release uh, in October. Uh, we'll see how far we get. So just by means of uh, demonstration, uh, I'm, I'm logged in here to the router in Plan Les Vots, that's uh, Geneva, uh, and I dumped the configuration of the chplo 0 uh, router into that YAML file. And uh, let's say that I wanted to edit that file, so I copy it to a new uh, YAML file and, and edit that thing. Uh, I might put stuff in there like some new interfaces, uh, gigabit ethernet B01, give it a description, an MTU, a Linux uh, control plane pair, and some sub interfaces. In case I created two, one VLAN tag 100 with an IP address and one VLAN tag 200, which I then cross connected uh, directly to gigabit ethernet B02. So this pair is completely semantic valid. Uh, if I had a typo there uh, or the MTUs didn't match up or the, the reference was a name of an interface that doesn't exist, the VPP config will uh, complain about it and refuse to commit it. But if I wanted to commit it though, I can make a plan for this uh, with VPP config plan. And this outputs to a file called vpp.exec and it created 22 lines in this case in the path plan from where I was before uh, to what I wanted to have in this, uh, in this new YAML config file. Um, the commands might look like this. Uh, I would delete LCP on uh, gigabit ethernet B02 and I create the sub interfaces and the LCPs and then I'll set a bunch of attributes on those interfaces too. And if I were to um, run the application, the apply for this, uh, it will send these as API commands to the data plane and now data plane reflects the thing that I had on my YAML file. So that's the data plane part. We can do all sorts of stuff with it, tunnels, bridges, um, regular interfaces, sub-interfaces, Q and Q, like all of that stuff. Uh, and we'll add more stuff, you know, as, as we need it uh, in the future. Maybe you want to help out with that. But then on the control plane side, uh, it's really uh, tricky to misconfigure your routers. Anyone who has a large uh, ISP with more than, say, five routers in production will know that eventually you'll make a typo and you're going to break something. Uh, and so as well on the control plane side, uh, I have a configuration utility originally written by the guys in Koloku in Amsterdam, uh, but I've uh, forked it or derived it or maybe rewritten it entirely into a thing uh, called a case for IPNG, and it's on GitHub as well. And this reads a set of YAML configuration files and uh, augments all the information I need from the peering DB and IRRDB and things like that. It uses BGP querying uh, to get our, our AS set lists and our prefix lists all, all in order. And then it constructs a per router configuration and, and it uses uh, Python and, and Jinja 2 uh, to emit a bunch of configuration files. And then when you, when you push the router, you know, you are synced to it and make sure that it safely rehashes the, the, the stuff that has changed, you know, based on the, the, the running uh, state of the routers themselves. Um, I don't have support for all sorts of stuff, but the stuff that I need uh, locally is, is unbound for my resolver, like the local firewall for the control plane side on, on Linux. Uh, Bird, of course, to do OSPF and BGP and things like that. Borgmatic to do backups, auto, automated backups for these machines. The SNMP agent, of course, that needs configuration. Uh, and VRRP for failover between them, and obviously the VPP can fix themselves. So how that might look like in the case of uh, the DECX in uh, Frankfurt, uh, I, may, uh, I may edit it and decide that I, I want to add uh, a presence at DECX Hamburg. Um, so I'll edit this file called ebgpdecx.yaml, and I'll put this snippet in there uh, together with the other stuff that's in the file. And, Notably here, peering DB IX is number 74. That's how you would find the Humbert peering uh, point from DECX on uh, peering DB. 
And then I'll give it some uh, BGP communities in general, 1070, but for this uh, AS43252, I'll give it the community 1071 to be able to make a distinction between route servers and non-route servers. And then all I do is add all the ASs that I would like to peer with, uh, and the tool uh, does the rest. Now that I've declared it, I also need to make sure that that uh, router in Frankfurt that's going to connect to the Hamburg exchange uh, picks that stuff up. And to do that, I'll add local addresses in its config file. And then using this tool case, I will merge all of these YAML config files and uh, inherit and override them and ultimately create like the full tree of uh, config that I may uh, need. Um, I do this in a tool called build. Um, build really just uh, creates a big Python uh, dictionary with all the information that it gathered along the way from peering to be and from the, the YAML files, uh, and then uh, runs a bunch of Jinja uh, templates to emit a bunch of files. And that may, may look like this. It's a, actually a very long list for this router, but I, I took the one that's relevant because we just added the Hamburg uh, site. Uh, and so here we, we do a bunch of lookups on peering to be to resolve all the information that we might need for those AS numbers. And it found the IPv4 and IPv6 addresses and, and AS sets and all that stuff directly on the, on the peering to be. And then ultimately it emits a bunch of files into a build output directory. And those files would be the ones that I may copy with rsync onto the machine. Does a bunch of pre-flight checks to make sure all these config files are actually valid. And in this case they were. So after I do that build, I can do a push very simply uh, to the machine, which rsyncs the copy uh, of the, the build files out uh, onto the machine, sets some permissions, does some other stuff in, in the back end there, and then reloads Berg uh, to pick up the new, uh, the new site. And then I can just git ops style commit this into uh, my git repo. And of course, as well, you may do this the other way around where you just commit stuff to the git repo, and then you have a runner on Jenkins that will pick this up every hour uh, and rebuild and push to those routers that have a change. Um, so with that, I can tie it all together uh, in production in Frankfurt. Uh, currently uh, this afternoon when I took a look about 8 million routes in the routing database and like about a million, a million two uh, in um, the IPv4 and IPv6 forwarding database. Of course, uh, our PKI and row that's all standard issue boilerplate, I think. Uh, but also because uh, the Linux control plane plugin in VPP does multicast and unicast for IPv4 and IPv6, uh, I can run OSPF uh, on, on this machine. And in this case, you'll see here a link up to Amsterdam and a link down to um, Zurich and Rumlang in, in this case, uh, and a local um, XE1-2.2006, which is a VLAN for some virtual machines there in, uh, in Frankfurt. This thing is really, really fast though. It converges a full table in about seven seconds and that includes programming all of it to the data plane. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see I've done an update a couple of days ago on a bunch of uh, machines at IPNG uh, and I can do a full uh, VPP update start to finish in 68 seconds. That's pretty cool. That means even my IBGP sessions do not uh, break. So with that, I'm gonna to go to a slightly different topic because there's another like really, really cool uh, DPDK app and it's called T-Rex. They're originally written by Cisco. It's a traffic load tester, it's open source, you can download it. And it uses DPDK and exposes a Python API as well. So you can program it to create certain traffic streams, uh, apply them to a port, measure the amount of traffic, latency, jitter, all those things. It does both stateless and stateful load testing. It's a really, really cool tool. And because it's in, integrated with DPDK, uh, you get about 10 to 15 million packets per core. So if you have a big machine, you do a lot of packets on this open source load tester. Uh, easily does one gig, 10, 25, and 40 gigs, and even 100 gig Mellanox cards, you can do line rate with them. If we look at T-Rex, uh, you configure it with a little YAML file that says, hey, I have two ports on these PCI buses uh, and uh, the source Mac for the purple port there is this, and please send all my traffic to this other Mac address as you emit traffic. And perhaps as well the other way around, you know, Mac B in light blue uh, is sending uh, traffic back to the original Mac A. And the cloud at the top here is called a device hunter test. It's the stuff that we are actually load testing. And all T-Rex does is count chickens. It sent packets out on one interface and it expects them back on the other one. And if it lost them, it assumes it is lost in the device under test. 
And if all of them come back, then the device under test is sustaining the load that we're sending to it. It's pretty straightforward. You don't have to use uh, Ethernet though. You can also use IP addresses if, if that's uh, easier for you. Uh, the thing will do ARPA resolution and, and make sure that it's sending the uh, IP addresses or the correct MAC addresses belonging uh, to them as well. So one of the really cool things about T-Rex is that you can program traffic streams on it using Scapy. It's a, a Python-based uh, programming language that uh, allows you to create uh, you know, source destination pairs, ranges, uh, tables of sizes and inter inter packet gaps and stream gaps and like all, all of this stuff together allow you to, to synthesize pretty realistic uh, traffic profiles and, and if you want even better realism you can also uh, give it pcaps uh, that you dumped before and just replay them with different source and destination addresses but anyway you create one of these streams and you apply them uh, to one or more ports and then it starts sending out traffic at a certain rate so this can be a bits per second rate this can be a packets per second rate or a percentage of line rate of the network card in T-Rex that is sending the traffic. So at IPNG, I have two methods to do load testing. Method number one is to have VPP use one CPU thread only uh, with one RX and TX queue. And then I send unidirectional traffic through it. And I'm just measuring how fast it can go. Like how many CPU cycles per packet does it need to switch say 1000 packets per second or a million or 10 million packets per second. And eventually it's gonna max out, right? CPUs are not infinite, right? And so we will see at some point like how many packets per second one CPU can do. And then my claim is that roughly you can multiply that by the amount of threads that you have in the machine to get the total throughput. Of course, assuming that you don't have other bottlenecks like PCI bandwidth and things like that. And then method number two is, is a little bit more like the RFC. Uh, so we start a bunch of CPU threads on VPP and then we send either unidirectional or bidirectional traffic and then ramp up the traffic higher and higher until eventually it stops uh, responding. And then we measure the point at which it breaks. And breakage here just means more than 0.1% of packet loss on the other side. So method one is actually really simple. There is a, a CLI, a console UI, uh, that you start a certain packet stream, in this case, one UDP packet over and over again at a thousand packets per second. You can pause this, resume this. You can update it to a higher or lower rate, like 1 million or 10 million or full line rate if you want, and then ultimately stop the load test. Uh, there's a console uh, as well that shows you the, the interesting statistics on T-Rex. Uh, in this case, I, I highlighted four parts of the screen to draw your attention to. Like number one is just the network card info that T-Rex is using. In this case, a 10 gigabit card that's transmitting on port zero and another one that's transmitting on port one. And then uh, number two there, the total L1 and L2 bits per second and packets per second and the utilization of the line in terms of percentage. And then on the other side, we're receiving these back and we're expecting all of them back. That's number three there. And hopefully number two and number three line up when we send 18 million packets per second or 10 million packets per second, we would like them back on the other side. And if you want even more numbers there, number four gives you the total byte count and packet count. And shown here in this screen cap is a bi-directional IMIX test, which is about 3.2 million packets per second in one direction and so 6.4 million in both directions and, and uh, T-Rex is, is using about 16% CPU. It means it has some way to go, about six times more than what you see here. The method two is uh, the one that ramps up like the RFC 2554. Uh, and there's a little uh, Python script that I wrote that uh, picks up uh, a certain traffic rate, uh, brings it to 100% of line, keeps it there for a while, and then uh, tries to ensure that the device under test has kept up along the way. So it emits a bunch of JSON that you can turn into a, uh, a graph like this one here, and, and I'll explain real quick what the graph is, and then we'll go over a couple of cases. On the x-axis here, we see time in seconds. And on the left-hand y-axis here, we see the amount of packets per second in millions. And on the right-hand side, we see the line rate fraction from zero to one. So a healthy load test will look like this. Uh, you have uh, the blue line, you tracked up to completion. Uh, first, we do a warm up uh, here at the bottom. Um, about 30 seconds, and we linearly ramp up to 100% of line rate, and then we keep it there for about 30 seconds to make sure that the device under test keeps up. If it doesn't, it looks like this. Like, let's say it handles only 35% of line rate, you can send it more, but no more is going to come out on the other side, and you know at this 
point that the load test is failing, you know, at a certain uh, rate of line. But if it does do a good job, it looks like this. It'll track to completion and uh, send you back 100% of the traffic that you sent it, which is nice. There's four uh, streams of, of uh, traffic that I find particularly interesting. Uh, one would be the large 1500 by MTU. It's not a lot of traffic in terms of packets per second, but it's a lot of volume. And I'll use random flows here, you know, multiple AB, uh, IP addresses and uh, ports. And if I do this, it's about 800,000 packets per second for one 10 gig link. Uh, or I send IMIX, which is kind of a mixture of 60, 590, and 15, 14 byte packets. Uh, it's about 3.2 million packets in one direction for 10 gig. Or I go like really low, the smallest we can send with 64 byte UDP, but still multiple flows. So I can leverage multiple receive queues on the, on the hardware. That's about 15 million packets per second at 10 uh, uh, gigabits. Uh, but we will be using uh, multiple queues in this case. If you want to be super insidious, you limit yourself to only one source destination pair. Uh, and now we we cannot use multiple received queues because every packet header will hash to the same uh, queue. This is typically very difficult uh, for software routers, but not only software routers, also hardware ones. Uh, ask me how I know. So I tested three machines. Uh, small one, uh, NetGate 610, uh, 6100, sorry, um, sent to me by uh, the friendly folks uh, at NetGate. It's an Atom uh, C3554 or 58. It's a very small CPU, but it's just super, super light on power. It's also cheap. It costs about 699 US dollars, and it has two 10 gig cards, uh, four two and a half gig, and two uh, one gig uh, combo cards with an SFP and uh, RJ45 as well. And then the machines that I used that I showed earlier at IPNG, the Supermicros with a Xeon D um, that has a little bit more CPU power, it's also a little bit more expensive, about twice has six uh, 10 gig cards and six one gig cards. And then the bigger one on the bench here that I have uh, in my lab is an ASRock Tai Chi uh, B550 chipset with a Ryzen 5950. That's a consumer CPU, but it's a really, really fast one. Uh, we'll see in a little bit how fast it is. And it's uh, again, double the price, but it has two times 100 gig, uh, four times 10 and, and four times one gig. So we'll see that although the price doubles, so does the performance. So method one is uh, uh, measuring how many CPU cycles we need to switch one packet from A to B. And if we do a thousand packets per second on the Atom, uh, you'll see 4,900 CPU cycles to move the packet through the machine. But if you ramp up and do more, you start amorting all of this iCache and dcache in the CPU. And even though the Atom has very limited CPU caching, it, it does help a lot. It gets um, at least one order of magnitude faster. Then eventually, if I send it 1 million packets per second, it'll do 600 uh, CPU cycles per packet. And if I send it 10 million packets per second, it'll do 358 uh, cycles per packet, half of it still, but it'll max out at 5 million. The Xeon D is a little bit better off. It maxes out at 10.2 million. And the Ryzen maxes out at 22.2 million. That's actually really cool because we only need 14.8 to do a, a unidirectional 10 gig. So we learn here that the Ryzen is actually happy doing a full line rate, 15 million packets per second with one CPU threat, and it has 32. Let's take a look at the kernels. I uh, looked at uh, FreeBSD, which is what PFSense uh, ships with. Uh, the, the NetGate machine comes with PFSense out of the box and the Linux kernel. And they're not very fast. If I do a single threaded load test, um, and I can only use one thread in, in the Linux kernel as well, uh, the Atom does about 630,000 um, packets per second. FreeBSD is very similar. The Ryzen is a little bit better, but not that much still, right? So these uh, kernels are all uh, down below. They're, they're kind of failing the load test. But with uh, VPP, everyone can be a winner. So the graph here tracks the completion for all of the CPUs. And this is not that strange because we know uh, that the smallest of them, the uh, Atom, can do already 5 million packets per second and we only need 810,000. So this is easy. Unidirectional, bidirectional, it doesn't matter. So far so good. By the way, when people say up to 10 gigabits, they typically do this type of test where they send really big packets and don't make the machine uh, work very hard. And I find these tests not very useful. Then at iMix, uh, we're sending an actual representative traffic mix for consumer uh, you know, network uh, traffic. And we can see everyone's still keeping up, like all the lines there track to completion. 
And if you were wondering, the bidirectional test is 6.4 million packets per second, and the single atom cord is only 5 million, but we can use two CPUs. So the first card will be on CPU one, and the other card will be on a different CPU thread, and so they can send traffic towards one another uh, linearly. And we have way more than uh, 3.2 million packets per second. So we're still good. And then the, the cracks start to show here with the atom, because if we send uh, a bunch of traffic through 64 byte frames, but multiple destination source pairs, and we only use one queue, then we'll max out at this aforementioned 5 million packets per second. Uh, that's the blue line down there. Uh, but we do scale linearly, and here's proof of it. If we take two queues, we'll do double the amount, about 10.2. And if we do three queues, uh, the green line there at the top, you'll see it tracks the completion again, uh, because we have 15 million available, and we only need 14.88. So the Xeon is a little bit faster. It does 10 million packets per second per core. Uh, so if you have one queue, it does that purple line. If you have two or three queues, it, it tracks the completion just fine. And the Ryzen doesn't even care. Uh, one queue is easily happily doing 14.8 uh, million because in total we measured earlier, it does like 22.3 or 22.4. So to really get these guys on their knees, uh, we can also send unidirectional traffic or bidirectional traffic with one flow, uh, thereby using only one CPU thread because we only can leverage one receive queue in the uh, um, in the NIC. And there you see uh, down below the atom here, even if you have three queues, it doesn't matter because uh, they'll only use one. Uh, and so the throughput there like really limits at 5 million. The Xeon there limits at uh, 10 and the Ryzen as before is, is happy to do full line rate. It's a little bit more of a consideration though. Um, the net gate is cheap. It's really cheap on power, like fully loaded. It still does 15.3 million packets per second and draws 19 watts at this case. That's like 1.24 microjoules per packet routed. That's a very, very low number. Um, the super micro is a little bit more uh, expensive on the CPU with 35 watt TDP. It has hyper threads though. And if you turn them off, you get about 10 million packets uh, per core. And if you turn them on, you get six, which is kind of nice because you get eight threads. And so you can uh, uh, use six of them for the data plane and two of them for the control plane, things like BGP. Uh, and then you'll uh, obtain about 38 million packets per second. Uh, and the machine then runs 48 watts, which is about 1.56 microjoules per packet. The Ryzen has a bigger CPU, also have many more threads. There's a very, very large internal L2 and L3 cache that you can leverage with VPP quite well. And at 15 cores, it does roughly 330 million packets per second. And then it takes 265 watts. So that's 0 0.8 microjoules per packet. Uh, but don't get fooled because the Ryzen only has 24 lanes of PCI and one 100 gig card will already take 16 of them. So you can't infinitely scale this up and you'll be limited actually not by the CPU, uh, but by the uh, PCI bus instead. So that's what I had, 43 minutes of it. I'm happy to take questions. I'm happy to chat with people, uh, voice or video. I'm also happy to just let you go. Uh, if you are insanely curious, I do have uh, an additional set of bonus material, but I'm happy to take questions first. I don't know where to start. This is awesome from the beginning until the end. Thank you very much for that. Um, usually for the questions, we stop the recording. So, I'd say if you have something more to share, now would be a good time, and then we do questions. Great. No, I totally got you, Max. Let's let's do that then. Uh, it's actually not uh, not that intricate. I just wanted uh, to play around a little bit with the with the CLI and show you uh, just what you can do uh, with the VPP data plane because it's actually quite powerful. Uh, the rack here to the left is my test rack. Uh, you have the hungry hungry hippo and its friend Rhino. Uh, with uh, two times 100 gigs uh, connected by uh, one of those fancy FS switches, and then a bunch of Dells down below that try to generate all the load. Typically, the Dells don't keep up with the uh, Ryzen's. So first, let's do a layer two cross connect. It's uh, very simple. We have Rhino here, and we have two 100 gig cards, and we set their state up, and we give them an MPU. Uh, and then we just type uh, set interface L2 X connect this one thing to the other, and the other thing to the one which means any packet will see any ethernet frame even coming in on uh, 100 1200 will get immediately marshaled out to 1201. 
and we've created an Ethernet pipe. But we don't have to do it only with physical interfaces, we can do it with sub interfaces as well. So as an example here, I'll create a QNQ or a QNAD with the outer tag being 100 and the inner tag being 200 and the outer protocol being dot 180, the original QNQ. And I'll set it up and I'll uh, give it an MTU of 9,000. And I'll use this uh, trick that is called VLAN gymnastics uh, in the industry to uh, take off the tags when I receive the frame uh, uh, by popping two, and remembering that. And so now I have the ethernet frame again and I can do stuff with that. And then when I send something out on this pipe, I will reverse the operation and add the tags back. So on the other side, I'll create just a normal dot one Q with uh, VLAN tag one, two, three, four, and I'll bring it up 900. And there we pop only one tag. And then I can cross connect these two as well, right? So now I've created a bridge really between some Q in AD versus some dot one Q on the, on the 100 gig port. And I'm free to use any other VLANs on any one of these ports as well. Like these are just service ports like you might have on your Juniper or your, your Cisco ASR. Uh, when I think uh, about um, ethernet over MPLS, uh, I'd, I'd love to do it. MPLS, I think it's a dying breed. There are uh, maybe smarter things that are as contemporary. Uh, one of them is VXLAN. It's just a, an underlay or an overlay of ethernet uh, over IP. So in this case, we'll create a 100 gig 1300 up and give it an MTU of 9000. And then we'll create 1201 with an MTU of 9100. And it's a bonus question to the, to, the, to the geeks if you can explain why this is exactly 9100. Give it an IPv6 address and then create a tunnel over it with VXLAN from a source and destination and some VNI 8298. We'll bring it up and then we'll uh, cross connect these two. And if you do the same on the other side, you have created a 100 gigabit uh, layer two cross connect over IP using just a little bit more MTU, of course, on the, the far side than on the near side. This is a completely transparent um, L2 circuit. You can do anything over it, including things like spanning tree and IPX and whatever old stuff that you might have. Uh, not only VXLAN though, we can use Geneve in the same way. So here I create a, a sub interface uh, with a dot one Q55 um, and I'll uh, give it a different IP address an IPv4 one in this case. Uh, and I will create a tunnel with Geneve, which is roughly the same thing really. And I'll cross connect those two uh, as well. And so now I actually have two interfaces cross connecting out over 100 gig 1201. Uh, one is VXLAN to this IPv6 address and the other is Geneve to the IPv4 address there. A little bit about performance. I measured this. Uh, the layer two cross connect just does 15 million packets per uh, second per core. It's like easy on the Ryzen. Uh, GRE is pretty fast, 14.34 uh, uh, or so. VXLAN is a little bit slower. It's, it's comparable, 14 million packets per second throughput through the tunnel with one CPU. Geneve is a little bit slower than that still. And then you can see the IPv6 variants of these are a little bit more involved, uh, but still the slowest one does 8 million packets per second per core. Uh, and all of this stuff is multi-threaded uh, because both Geneve and VXLAN can use varying source ports, uh, which means that the receiving side can use multiple receive queues. Yeah, one more demo uh, real quick, just bridge domains are kind of a popular thing uh, in, uh, in the industry. So I'll create a bridge domain here called BD10 and I'll set uh, an interface uh, gigabit ethernet 1000 up and give it an MTU and then bridge it into uh, the bridge domain. And give it a BVI uh, bridge virtual interface. It's the IP address that you would put on the bridge really. And I'll give it uh, an IPv4 and an IPv6 address. Uh, and so now anything behind gig 1000 can ping this, uh, this machine. If I create an interface pair for it, in this case, LCP create BVI 10, that's the one that it's called in um, VPP as a host interface in Linux, also called BVI 10. Uh, it pops up with the IP addresses that I configured on it right there. Uh, we can do bonding as well, uh, normal XOR, but also smarter stuff like uh, LACP signaling. So in this case, I'll create a bond Ethernet and give it an MTU of 9000 again, and then add two 10 gig ports to it, 500 and 501, uh, put them up, and then add that to the bridge as well. 
And so now I have the two 10 gig ports as a 20 gig lag with LICP signaling and the one, 10 gig, uh, one, one gig port. Uh, and they can all, of course, see the VVI, the IP addresses on it. And if I wanted to, I can as well bridge uh, the VLAN, uh, sorry, the VXLAN and the Geneve tunnels into this bridge domain. So in this case, the cross connects that I made earlier, they're all seeing this bridge domain here. It's very powerful stuff. That's what I had. <laughs> Thanks for the extra six minutes of airtime. I'll now uh, maybe start to stop the recording and then we can, uh, we can go on to questions. You can tell me how bad I did. Thank you very much. And I can tell you already, you did not bad at all. <laughs>